This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 15 Newland Archer arrived at the Chiverses on Friday evening, and on Saturday went conscientiously through all the rites appertaining to a weekend at High Bank. In the morning he had a spin in the ice-boat with his hostess and a few of the hardier guests. In the afternoon he went over the farm with Reggie and listened, in the elaborately appointed stables, to long and impressive disquisitions on the horse. After tea, he talked in a corner of the firelit hall with a young lady who had professed herself broken-hearted when his engagement was announced, but was now eager to tell him of her own matrimonial hopes. And finally, about midnight, he assisted in putting a goldfish in one visitor's bed, dressed up a burglar in the bathroom of a nervous aunt, and saw in the small hours, by joining in a pillow fight, that ranged from the nurseries to the basement. But on Sunday, after luncheon, he borrowed a cutter and drove over to Scoiter Cliff. Peep had always been told that the house at Scoiter Cliff was an Italian villa. Those who had never been to Italy believed it. So did some who had. The house had been built by Mr. Vanderloyden in his youth, on his return from the Grand Tour, and in anticipation of his approaching marriage with Miss Louisa Dagonet. It was a large, square, wooden structure, with tongue-and-grooved walls painted pale green and white, a Corinthian portico, and fluted pilasters between the windows. From the high ground on which it stood, a series of terraces by balustrades and urns descended in the steel engraving style to a small, irregular lake, with an asphalt edge overhung by rare weeping conifers. To the right and left, the famous weedless lawns, studded with specimen trees of a different variety, rolled away to long ranges of grass, crested with elaborate cast-iron ornaments. And below, in a hollow, lay the four-roomed stone house which the first patroon had built on the land granted him in 1612. Against the uniform sheet of snow and the grayish winter sky, the Italian villa loomed up rather grimly. Even in summer it kept its distance, and the boldest coleus bed had never ventured nearer than thirty feet from its awful front. Now, as Archer rang the bell, the long tinkle seemed to echo through a mausoleum, and the surprise of the butler, who at length responded to the call, was as great as though he had been summoned from his final sleep. Happily, Archer was of the family, and therefore, irregular though his arrival was, entitled to be informed that the Countess Olenska was out having driven to afternoon service with Mrs. Vanderloyden exactly three-quarters of an hour earlier. "'Mr. Vanderloyden,' the butler continued, "'is in, sir, but my impression is that he is either finishing his nap or else reading yesterday's evening post. I heard him say, sir, on his return from church this morning, that he intended to look through the evening post after luncheon.' If you like, sir, I might go to the library door and listen. But Archer, thanking him, said that he would go and meet the ladies, and the butler, obviously relieved, closed the door on him majestically. A groom took the cutter to the stables, and Archer struck through the park to the high road. The village of Scoiter Cliff was only a mile and a half away, but he knew that Mrs. Vanderloyden never walked and that he must keep to the road to meet the carriage. Presently, however, coming down a footpath that crossed the highway, he caught sight of a slight figure in a red cloak with a big dog running ahead. 
He hurried forward, and Madame Olenska stopped short with a smile of welcome. "'Ah, oh, you've come!' she said, and drew her hand from her muff. The red cloak made her look gay and vivid, like the Ellen Mingott of old days, and he laughed as he took her hand and answered, "'I came to see what you were running away from.' Her face clouded over, but she answered, "'Ah, well, you will see presently.' The answer puzzled him. "'Why, do you mean that you've been overtaken?' She shrugged her shoulders with a little movement like Nastasia's, and rejoined in a lighter tone, "'Shall we walk on? I'm so cold after the sermon. What does it matter now you're here to protect me?' The blood rose to his temples, and he caught a fold of her cloak. "'Ellen, what is it? You must tell me.' "'Oh, presently, let's run a race first. My feet are freezing to the ground,' she cried, and gathering up the cloak she fled away across the snow, the dog leaping about her with challenging barks. For a moment Archer stood watching, his gaze delighted by the flash of the red meteor against the snow. Then he started after her, and they met, panting and laughing, at a wicket that led into the park. She turned up at him and smiled. "'I knew you'd come.' "'That shows you wanted me to,' he returned, with a disproportionate joy in their nonsense." The white glitter of the trees filled the air with its own mysterious brightness, and as they walked over the snow the ground seemed to sing under their feet. "'Where did you come from?' Madame Olenska asked. He told her and added, "'It was because I got your note.' After a pause she said, with a just perceptive chill in her voice, "'May asked you to take care of me.' I didn't need any asking. You mean I am so evidently helpless and defenseless? What a poor thing you must all think me. But women here seem not, seem never to feel the need, any more than the blessed in heaven. He lowered his voice to ask, What sort of need? Oh, don't ask me. I don't speak your language, she retorted petulantly. The answer smote him like a blow, and he stood still in the path looking down at her. What did I come for, if I don't speak yours? Oh, my friend. She laid her hand lightly on his arm, and he pleaded earnestly, Ellen, why won't you tell me what's happened? She shrugged again. Does anything ever happen in heaven? He was silent, and they walked on a few yards without exchanging a word. Finally, she said, I will tell you, but where, where, where... One can't be alone for a minute in that great seminary of a house with all the doors wide open and always a servant bringing tea or a log for the fire or the newspaper. Is there nowhere in an American house where one may be by oneself? You're so shy, and yet you're so public. I always feel as if I were in the convent again or on the stage before a dreadfully polite audience that never applauds. Oh, you don't like us, Archer exclaimed. They were walking past the house of the old patroon, with its squat walls and small square windows compactly grouped around a central chimney. The shutters stood wide, and through one of the newly washed windows Archer caught the light of a fire. "'Why, the house is open,' he said. She stood still. "'No, only for today, at least. I wanted to see it, and Mr. Vanderloyden had the fire lit— and the windows open so that we might stop there on the way back from church this morning. She ran up the steps and tried the door. It's still unlocked. What luck? Come in and we can have a quiet talk. Mrs. Vanderloyden has driven over to see her old aunts at Rhinebeck, and we shan't be missed at the house for another hour. He followed her into the narrow passage. His spirits, which had dropped at her last words, rose with an irrational leap. The homely little house stood there, its panels and brasses shining in the firelight as if magically created to receive them. A big bed of embers still gleamed in the kitchen chimney, under an iron pot hung from an ancient crane. Rush-bottomed armchairs faced each other across the tiled hearth, and rows of delft plates stood on shelves against the walls. 
Archer stooped over and threw a log upon the embers. Madame Olenska, dropping her cloak, sat down in one of the chairs. Archer leaned against the chimney and looked at her. "'You're laughing now, but when you wrote me, you were unhappy,' he said. "'Yes,' she paused. "'But I can't feel unhappy when you're here.' "'I shan't be here long,' he rejoined, his lips stiffening with the effort to say just so much, and no more. "'No, I know, but I'm improvident. I live in the moment when I'm happy.' The words stole through him like a temptation, and to close his senses to it, he moved away from the hearth and stood gazing out at the black tree boles against the snow. But it was as if she too had shifted her place, and he still saw her, between himself and the trees, drooping over the fire with her indolent smile. Archer's heart was beating insubordinately. What if it were from him that she had been running away, and if she had waited to tell him so till they were here alone together in this secret room? Ellen, if I'm really a help to you, if you really wanted me to come, tell me what's wrong, tell me what it is you're running away from, he insisted. He spoke without shifting his position, without even turning to look at her. If the thing was to happen, it was to happen in this way, with the whole width of the room between them, and his eyes still fixed on the outer snow. For a long moment she was silent, and in that moment Archer imagined her, almost heard her, stealing up behind him to throw her light arms around his neck. While he waited, soul and body throbbing with the miracle to come, his eyes mechanically received the image of a heaven man with his fur collar turned up, who was advancing along the path to the house. The man was Julius Beaufort. Ha <laughs> ha! Archer cried, bursting into a laugh. Madame Olenska had sprung up and moved to his side, slipping her hand into his, but after a glance through the window, her face paled, and she shrank back. "'So that was it,' Archer said derisively. "'I didn't know he was here,' Madame Olenska murmured. Her hand still clung to Archer's, but he drew away from her and, walking the passage, threw open the door of the house. "'Hello, Beaufort. This way.' Madame Olenska was expecting you, he said. During his journey back to New York the next morning, Archer relived, with a fatiguing vividness, his last moments at Scoiter Cliff. Beaufort, though clearly annoyed at finding him with Madame Olenska, had, as usual, carried off the situation high-handedly. His way of ignoring people whose presence inconvenienced him actually gave them, if they were sensitive to it, a feeling of invisibility, of non-existence. Archer, as the three strolled back through the park, was aware of this odd sense of disembodiment, and, humbling as it was to his vanity, it gave him the ghostly advantage of observing unobserved. Beaufort had entered the little house with his usual easy assurance— but he could not smile away the vertical line between his eyes. It was fairly clear that Madame Olenska had not known that he was coming, though her words to Archer had hinted at the possibility. At any rate, she had evidently not told him where she was going when she left New York, and her unexplained departure had exasperated him. The ostensible reason of his appearance was the discovery, the very night before, of a perfect little house— not in the market, which was really just the thing for her, but would be snapped up instantly if she didn't take it, and he was loud in mock reproaches for the dance she had led him in running away, just as he had found it. If only this new dodge for talking along a wire had been a little bit nearer perfection, I might have told you all this from town, 
and been toasting my toes before the club fire at this minute, instead of tramping after you through the snow, he grumbled, disguising a real irritation under the pretense of it. And at this opening Madame Olenska twisted the talk away, to the fantastic possibility that they might one day actually converse with each other from street to street, or even, incredible dream, from one town to another. This struck from all three allusions to Edgar Poe and Jules Verne and such platitudes as naturally rise to the lips of the most intelligent when they are talking against time and dealing with a new invention in which it would seem ingenuous to believe too soon. And the question of the telephone carried them safely back house. Mrs. van der Luyden had not yet returned and Archer took his leave and walked off to fetch the cutter while Beaufort followed the Countess Olenska indoors. It was probable that, little as the van der Luydens encouraged unannounced visits, he could count on being asked to dine and sent back to the station to catch the nine o'clock train. But more than that he would certainly not get, for it would be inconceivable to his hosts that a gentleman travelling without luggage should wish to spend the night, and, distasteful to them, to propose it to a person with whom they were on terms of such limited cordiality as Beaufort. Beaufort knew all this, and must have foreseen it, and his taking the long journey for so small a reward gave the measure of his impatience. He was undeniably in pursuit of the Countess Olenska, and Beaufort had only one object in view in his pursuit of pretty women. His dull and childless home had long since palled on him, and, in addition to more permanent consolations, he was always in quest of amorous adventures in his own set. This was the man from whom Madame Olenska was avowedly flying. The question was whether she had fled because his importunities displeased her, or because she did not wholly trust herself to resist them. Unless, indeed, all her talk of flight had been a blind, and her departure no more than a maneuver. Archer did not really believe this. Little as he had actually seen of Madame Olenska, he was beginning to think that he could read her face, and if not her face, her voice, and both had betrayed annoyance and even dismay at Beaufort's sudden appearance. But, after all, if this were the case, was it not worse than if she had left New York for the express purpose of meeting him? If she had done that, she ceased to be an object of interest. She threw in her lot with the vulgarest of dissemblers, a woman engaged in a love affair with Beaufort, classed herself irretrievably. No, it was worse a thousand times if— Judging Beaufort, and probably despising him, she was yet drawn to him by all that gave him an advantage over the other men about her. His habit of two continents and two societies, his familiar association with artists and actors and people generally in the world's eye, and his careless contempt for local prejudices. Beaufort was vulgar. He was uneducated. He was purse-proud. But the circumstances of his life, and a certain native shrewdness, made him better worth talking to than many men, morally and socially his betters, whose horizon was bounded by the Battery and the Central Park. How should anyone coming from a wider world not feel the difference and be attracted by it? Madame Olenska, in a burst of irritation, had said to Archer that he and she did not talk the same language, and the young man knew that in some respects this was true. But Beaufort understood every turn of her dialect, and spoke it fluently. His view of life, his tone, his attitude, were merely a coarser reflection of those revealed in Count Olenski's letter. This might seem to be his disadvantage with Count Olenski's wife, but Archer was too intelligent to think that a young woman like Ellen Olenska would necessarily recoil from everything that reminded her of her past. She might believe herself wholly in revolt against it, but what had charmed her in it would still charm her, even though it were against her will. 
Thus, with a painful impartiality, did the young man make out the case for Beaufort and for Beaufort's victim. A longing to enlighten her was strong in him, and there were moments when he imagined that all she asked was to be enlightened. That evening he unpacked his books from London. The box was full of things he had been waiting for impatiently, a new volume of Herbert Spencer, another collection of the prolific Alphonse Daudet's brilliant tales, and a novel called Middlemarch, as to which there had lately been interesting things said in the reviews. He had declined three dinner invitations in favor of this feast, but though he turned the pages with the sensuous joy of the book lover, he did not know what he was reading and one book after another dropped from his hand. Suddenly among them he lit on a small volume of verse which he had ordered because the name had attracted him, The House of Life. He took it up and found himself plunged in an atmosphere unlike any he had ever breathed in books, so warm, so rich, and yet so ineffably tender that it gave a new and haunting beauty to the most elementary of human passions. All through the night he pursued through those enchanted pages the vision of a woman who had the face of Ellen Olenska. But when he woke the next morning and looked out at the brownstone houses across the street and thought of his desk in Mr. Letterblair's office and the family pew in Grace Church, his hour in the park of Scoiter Cliff became as far outside the pale of probability as the visions of the night. "'Mercy, how pale you look, Newland!' Janey commented over the coffee cups at breakfast, and his mother added, "'Newland, dear, I've noticed lately that you've been coughing. I do hope you're not letting yourself be overworked.' For it was the conviction of both ladies that— under the iron despotism of his senior partners, the young man's life was spent in the most exhausting professional labors, and he had never thought it necessary to undeceive them. The next two or three days dragged by heavily. The taste of the usual was like cinders in his mouth, and there were moments when he felt as if he were being buried alive under his future. He heard nothing of the Countess Olenska or of the perfect little house, and though he met Beaufort at the club, they merely nodded at each other across the whist tables. It was not until the fourth evening that he found a note awaiting him on his return home. Come late tomorrow. I must explain to you, Ellen. Those were the only words it contained. The young man who was dining out thrust the note into his pocket, smiling a little at the Frenchness of the to you. After dinner he went to a play, and it was not until his return home after midnight that he drew Madame Olenska's missive out again and reread it slowly a number of times. There were several ways of answering it, and he gave a considerable thought to each one during the watches of an agitated night. That on which, when morning came, he finally decided was to pitch some clothes into a portmanteau and jump on board a boat that was leaving that very afternoon for St. Augustine. End of Chapter 15